Well, you can turn with me in your Bibles to John's Gospel. We're in John chapter 8. Our focus will be on the woman caught in adultery, verses 1 to 11. But I want to read verses 1 to 20 just to set the narrative in its larger context. So John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their, own, uh, by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Amen. Well, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for a beautiful day. Truly, the heavens declare your righteousness, your glory, your majesty. We see your handiwork in the created order. As well, the psalmist tells us our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. We know that you are sovereign in providence. And God, on these Lord's days, we reflect especially on your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness revealed to us in the gospel of our salvation. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we receive through faith in him. We thank you for that righteousness of his that is given to us and received by faith alone. And we pray that as we reflect upon our blessed Lord, our hearts would be drawn out in worship and praise and adoration to our great God. Forgive us for all of our sin and unrighteousness. We pray that you would cleanse us in the blood of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would take the scriptures and apply them in our hearts and minds. And we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this is a very famous passage of Scripture. There is a textual variant here which we're not going to deal with, simply to say that this is the Holy Word of the living and true God, and it displays the wisdom of our blessed Savior. The Pharisees essentially put him on the horns of a dilemma. They want him to either A, choose Moses, or B, choose compassion. Whichever way he chooses, they'll sort of expose him in the opposite direction. If he upholds the law, then he's not a friend for sinners. If he's a friend for sinners, then he doesn't uphold the law. So Christ wisely navigates and takes the horns of a dilemma and answers in a most wonderful way. He upholds the law of Moses and he exercises compassion to this woman that was caught in adultery. Before we look at the text, notice back in chapter 7 at verse 37. Chapter 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus goes to Jerusalem at that particular time. He goes to the temple during the feast and he preaches or he teaches. 
And on the last day of the feast, according to verse 7, there was this symbol, uh, symbolism that was going on. They'd fetch water out of the pool of Siloam on that last day of the feast. They'd bring it over to the altar. They'd pour it on the altar, make way, uh, making way for the sacrifice. So this was the, the, the situation that obtained in that last day. But notice what Jesus does. He, he stood and he cries out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, when he says, come to me and drink, he's using a metaphor. He's not talking about actual water. He's talking about everlasting life. He's talking about the forgiveness of sins. He's talking about a righteousness that avails with God. He's talking about the reason for which he came, to give life to dead sinners. And so at that last day, that great day of the feast, he rises up and he makes that glorious statement. Now, when we get to this woman caught in adultery, she doesn't come in the conventional way, does she? The conventional way would be preach the gospel, tell sinners about their sin, point them to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one in whom there is forgiveness. She didn't come that way. She was brought. She's a sinner. She is guilty. She's a criminal. It's a capital offense, uh, uh, actually. And so they bring this woman to the Savior. But however she got there, she receives this water of everlasting life. She forgives her. She receives, rather, the forgiveness of sin by the one who is altogether lovely and chief among 10,000. So let's break the narrative into two parts. First, the woman brought to Christ in verses 1 to 6. And then secondly, the woman forgiven by Christ in verses 7 to 11. And there are three observations in verses 1 to 6. First, the setting, verses 1 and 2. Secondly, the accusation, verses 3 and 4. And then finally, the issue in verses 5 and 6. But notice the setting. It's connected to chapter 7. So the Feast of Tabernacles is ended. It's a week-long feast. It's one of those national feasts that Israel is commanded to obey. And so at the conclusion of the feast, at the end of chapter 7, we notice in verse 53, and everyone went to his own house. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, most likely to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They lived in Bethany, which was not far from the Mount of Olives. Whether he went to stay with them or he stayed at the Mount and there he prayed and communed with the Father, the point is, is that he's still close to Jerusalem. He's still in proximity, and we see that in verse 2. Notice, now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So that morning following the Feast of Tabernacles, that morning following that great day of the feast when he offers living water, he then returns early in the morning to the temple and there he preaches. He continues through chapter 8, teaching and having a confrontation with the religious leaders that culminates in verse 59 with them once again wanting to kill him. These men had a real problem with, with the sixth commandment. And as we look at this narrative, we see they had a problem with the seventh commandment as well. But look at what the text says in verse 2. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him. That probably outraged the scribes and the Pharisees. Remember, back in chapter 7, it wasn't a matter of theology. It wasn't a dispute or a debate over a fine point in the theological, uh, in theological examination. They hated him. They despised him. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to take him. They wanted to bring him somewhere, and they wanted to execute him. Now, they eventually will, according to the unfolding narrative, but this probably outraged them when all the people came to him. You see a similar situation in his earthly ministry in Luke 15, when all the tax collectors and the sinners draw near to him to hear him. And then the scribes and the Pharisees, they look down their noses on this particular situation. They say, this man receives sinners and, and eats with them. As far as they were concerned, that was disgusting. As far as we're concerned, that was a confession of the glories of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does receive sinners. He does eat with sinners. He does forgive sinners. He does give a righteousness to sinners. And we rejoice in that. So all these people are coming to him in the temple now to hear him. No doubt this enraged the religious leaders. Notice that he sits down as well. 
He does the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. Rabbinic teaching was not like Christian preaching. The Christian preacher comes behind the pulpit and there proclaims the truth. What the synagogue or what the rabbi did was he sat down. This was an authoritative position. Jesus upbraided the religious leaders of his time in Matthew 23, saying, they sit in the seat of Moses and they give you these commands, but they themselves don't do that. And so he takes this authoritative position in the temple to teach and to preach. And again, humanly speaking, you can see why the religious leaders despise him. They loathe and abhor him because all the people are coming to him and they're no longer coming to them. They were bankrupt, they were unspiritual, they were godless, and they were indicative of the religious situation in Israel in that first century setting. Now notice the accusation relative to this woman. I don't want to get all psychological and weird in exposition this morning, but imagine this woman. I mean, imagine being caught in the act of adultery. Obviously, don't engage in an act of adultery, and you won't be caught in an act of adultery. But imagine being caught in the act of adultery and having these fiends grab you and take you over to Jesus to test him. It's not ultimately the woman that's on trial in this particular narrative. It's Jesus that's on trial, and John will make that sufficiently clear. But notice in verse 3, it says, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Now, if you turn back for just a moment to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20. So the woman is caught in adultery, and adultery in Old Covenant Israel was a capital offense. In Leviticus chapter 20 at verse 10, we read that. It says, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And then over in chapter, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22, same sort of an emphasis. There's a whole host of sexual crimes that are indicated in chapter 22, but the one specifically addressing adultery is in chapter 22, verse 22. It says, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die, the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. So they bring this woman to Jesus according to verse 3. This is the scribes and the Pharisees. These are the men that are supposed to be leaders in Israel. And again, as we move through the narrative, they don't care about the law of Moses. They don't care about this woman. They certainly don't care about capital punishment falling on the proper head. If the woman was caught in the act of adultery, there had to have been a man there. In fact, the texts are very specific. It's both the man and the woman that is executed for this particular crime of adultery. We see that in verse 4. They make their formal charge or accusation against the woman. Again, she's in the midst of them. You kind of wonder if she said, you know, guys, I'm standing right here. Do we have to do this in, in front of everybody, strangers, and everybody assembled in the temple on this particular day? Notice in verse 4, they said to him, teacher... This is mockery. They don't see him and esteem him as a rabbi, as a teacher. They're just mocking. They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. So if she was caught in the very act, again, I suggest that there was a man involved. There had to be another participant. This was not a one-person crime. This was a two-person crime, as Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22 make very clear. It's not just the woman. It's the woman and the man that are guilty. And in fact, in Deuteronomy 22, it says, if a man is found lying with a woman, that finding is necessary in order to corroborate the charge. You don't just speculate. You don't just engage in gossip. You don't engage in hearsay. Rather, it had to be in the very act in order for this to be uh, punishable by death. And so this is the particular scenario. Now, as we move into verses 5 and 6, we see what the real issue is. In verse 5, they appeal to Moses. Now, I think they're going tit for tat with Jesus when they make this appeal to Moses. Because remember back in chapter 7, the Lord Jesus didn't want to go to Jerusalem or go to Judea because he knew the religious leaders wanted to kill him. Nevertheless, he does go. He goes in the, uh, to the Feast of the ta uh, Tabernacles during the time uh, or uh, at the temple. 
and he indicts them. He upbraids them in chapter 7 at verse 19. Look what he says. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? This goes back to chapter 5. They wanted to kill him because of what they thought was blasphemy and what they thought was Sabbath breaking. So why do you seek to kill me? This causes a response from some in the crowd. They say, oh, you're mad. You, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And then Jesus explains in verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Then again, notice what he does. He asks them or he appeals to Moses in verse 19. And then in verse 24, he gives this general principle that is most consistent with Moses' teaching. In other words, you're not supposed to engage in a kangaroo court. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And then we saw in chapter 7, verses 50 and 51, even Nicodemus called them out. Nicodemus says, you know, guys, doesn't our law say that we need to verify or validate that somebody's actually a criminal before we take him and kill him? Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, it says that. But instead of responding favorably to Nicodemus, they simply mock him as well. Are, are you also from Galilee? Are you just another one of these fools that have gotten on the Jesus bandwagon? So you see what's happening here. They're now trying to get Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. They want to show him or expose him as being an antinomian, of being an anti-law person, somebody that has a problem with Moses. And so this is the nature of their statement. They appeal to Moses and then they question Jesus. So notice in verse 5, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, I mentioned that they have no regard for the law. They have no concern whatsoever for due process. They have no concern whatsoever for this woman. Again, she's just sitting there, standing there in the midst of them, probably feeling all kinds of shame, all kinds of embarrassment, being outed. I mean, we all sin, don't we? But we don't all come to church and get to stand in the midst of everybody with some sort of indicator of what our particular sins are. So this woman is standing there in the midst of all these people. And again, the religious leaders don't care about her. They don't care about Moses. They don't care about the crowd. They care about getting rid of Jesus. What do you say? Now, Jesus was not a civil authority. He was not a judge. He had no place. Now, we know that Jesus, second person of the Trinity, the word became flesh. He dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. John 1, 14 the incarnate Son of God. But the incarnate Son of God was not a civil magistrate. The incarnate Son of God in his earthly sojourn was a carpenter until he embarked on his earthly ministry, his three-year public ministry. So he's not a judge. He has no authority to rule in these particular matters. Also, he's not an ecclesiastical or a churchly authority. He doesn't have a rank. He doesn't have a title. He's not part of the Sanhedrin. There is essentially nothing that Jesus can do with reference to this woman who was caught in adultery, caught in the very act. John tells us, he tips the hand of the Pharisees and scribes in verse 6. He tells us what the issue is. It says, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. As I mentioned, they put him on what's called in logic, the horns of a dilemma. And a particular textbook on logic says it's a common form of argument in ordinary discourse in which it is claimed that a choice must be made between two alternatives, both of which are bad. There's no good option here as far as the Pharisees and the scribes are concerned. If he upholds the law, again, he shows that he's not really a friend of sinners. If he disregards the law of Moses and shows himself as a friend for sinners, they got him. They're going to ruin him. They're going to show him up as a fake and a fraud. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, do not think that I came to abolish the law. I didn't come to abolish it, but rather to, to confirm it, to strengthen it, to bring it home, only uh, in, his, uh, in his obedience and then as well in his teaching. 
So these men want to test him by putting him on this horns. If he's pro-Moses, he's anti-compassion. If he's pro-compassion, then he's anti-Moses. So again, horns of a dilemma. Both alternatives are equally difficult, right? Especially for this woman. How do you think she wants him to go? How do you think she wants him to respond? Do you think she wants him to say, oh yeah, take her out right now and stone her to death with stones? That would be legitimate, again, if he was a civil authority or an ecclesiastical authority and had the jurisdiction to render a verdict on this particular issue. But notice as well what he does, the action that he undertakes in verse 6b. It says, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now, commentators speculate on what he wrote. We have no idea what he wrote. The text doesn't tell us. It's quiet. But there's significance in the fact that he wrote. And if you've been in our studies in Exodus or when we've talked about the law of God and the uniqueness of the moral law of God, you see in the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, these statements where Yahweh, God Most High, speaks about writing the Ten Commandments with his finger. I'm not suggesting Jesus is writing the Ten Commandments. I think the emphasis is, is that he stoops down now, and the text is specific with verse 6. He writes with his finger. He doesn't get a stick. He doesn't, you know, just kind of use the palm of his hand. He uses his finger. I think there's a link there between the Old Testament giving of the moral law and Jesus Christ's function as that lawgiver. I think this action in and of itself suggests how the narrative is going to flow. Jesus is not anti-Moses. Jesus is not anti-law. Jesus is the author of the law that Moses carried out. Moses didn't develop the law. Moses didn't originate the law. Moses didn't go up on that mountain and say, okay, I've got some good ideas for how we do society now. I want everybody to listen, rally around Daddy Moses, and I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. No, he got the law from God Most High, written with the finger of God, and it was that that Moses brought down from the mountain. Exodus 31, 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Deuteronomy 9, 10. Then the Lord delivered me uh, to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. I think by way of action, by way of sort of an acted parable, he's upholding or demonstrating his commitment to the law. He is the law giver. He is the law keeper. And by way of implication, they're not. When Jesus asks them in, in John 7, 19, when he appeals to Moses with reference to their murderous intention of him, he's serious there. These men don't keep the law. These men are rebels. These men have rejected the truth. And these men want this kangaroo court not so that they can sort of validly uh, apply the law and expose this criminal in Israel, but it was in order to test him. And so that's the particular issue that's in view. Now notice, secondly, the woman forgiven by Christ in verses 7 to 11. Two things here. First, the application of the law. And secondly, the forgiveness of the woman. How do you deal with the horns of a dilemma? You take them both and you uphold them both. And that is precisely what Jesus does in his transaction here. Notice in the first place, in terms of the application of the law, he appeals to Moses. There is an appeal to Moses in verse 7. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to appeal to Moses. He's appealing to the law in order to carry out the law. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. That's an appeal to Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19. In a capital crime. Again, it couldn't be hearsay. It couldn't just be one witness. It couldn't just be, you know, I think this guy committed murder or I think this girl committed adultery. Well, let's haul them off and let's kill them. That's not the way the Bible mandates. There were to be two or three witnesses and it was the witnesses that would take up the stone first to throw at the guilty criminal. What do you think that would do to you? I mean, we all have our challenges. We all have our issues. We all have our sins to be sure. 
But for the most part, people don't typically like to engage, unless they're affiliated with certain political parties, in raw, brutal hypocrisy. We don't like to do that. And when Jesus is talking about without sin, he's not suggesting that there's a sinless class of beings out there that can render verdicts in criminal court. No, he's probably indicating he who is without this particular sin of adultery. They had a problem with the sixth commandment. The commentators, to, uh, if the commentators are to be believed, they had a problem with the seventh commandment. Take Muslim countries, for instance. They're pretty, pro, or pretty anti-homosexuality. They're very stringent in terms of Sharia and the application of their law that you're not supposed to be a homosexual. Do you think that means there's no homosexuals in the Middle East? Of course there are. Of course they do that. And do you think just because these guys are part of the Sanhedrin, the religious authorities, the, the political authorities in Israel at that time, that they're holy, harmless, and undefiled? They're wretches. They're sinners. They're vile. They've already shown disregard for the sixth commandment in that they want to murder an innocent man. Seventh commandment? Why do we think they're going to be fastidious with reference to that? They had girlfriends. They had, you know, friends with benefits. All those sorts of things on the side. And so Jesus, in his appeal to the law, understands that the, the, the witnesses must be the first to cast the stone. So he says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Deuteronomy 17, 6 and 7. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Keep this in your head, because as we close out this, after, uh, this morning, not this afternoon, you don't have to fear that much, but uh, when we close out, you'll know that, that, that this passage is invoked as an anti-death penalty passage. Well, Jesus didn't execute the woman, so therefore, there's no death penalty. Again, Jesus isn't a civil authority. Jesus isn't an ecclesiastical authority. And the ecclesiastical authority in Old Covenant Israel never bore the sword against criminal offenders. That was the judiciary. That was the political element of the apparatus, which was known as the Commonwealth of Israel. But with reference to this passage, he upholds the law. He upholds the death penalty in this particular instance for the crime of adultery. And he understands the necessity for witnesses. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil from among you. See this in Deuteronomy 13, 19. And then the laws of witnesses in Deuteronomy 19, 15 to 21. So this is Jesus appealing to the law. Here's your sort of dilemma, Jesus. What do you think of Moses? What do you think of the law? Well, I uphold Moses and I uphold the law. Where are the witnesses? If we're going to proceed according to Moses, you need to pony up two or three witnesses. Now, with reference to the witnesses, they need to be responsible witnesses. And I think that's the emphasis in the first part of the verse. He who is without sin among you. He was without this particular sin among you. Let him throw a stone at her first. Matthew Poole says, In reason, those who are zealous for the punishment of others should neither be guilty of the same nor of greater crimes themselves. That's a good reading of Deuteronomy 17 and 19. Meredith Klein says a minimum of two witnesses was required and their confidence in their own testimony was to be evidenced by their assuming the dread responsibility of delivering the first and quite possibly lethal blows in the execution of the condemned. We know that this is the way we should interpret this based on what happens in verse 9. They all get convicted. Their consciences are bothered. They're not responsible witnesses. This is a kangaroo court. They don't care about Moses. They don't care about the woman. They don't care about the man that was with the woman. All they care about is escalating their threat, their enmity, and their animosity against Jesus Christ. Why? Wasn't theology, wasn't Bible, wasn't ethics. It was politics. The Lord Jesus now had all kinds of people drawing near him to hear him. 
And as far as the leadership was concerned, if that keeps happening, then the entire world's going to go after him. You see that in John, 9, uh, John chapter 12. They make that complaint. If things keep going unabated, then the whole world's going to draw after him. This was what in sense uh, outraged them. It made them furious and it made them want to get rid of him. Notice verse 8, after he makes that statement, after he appeals to the book of, uh, De book of Deuteronomy, verse 8 tells us again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. We still don't know what he's writing. And then verse 9, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in his midst or in the midst. So again, no regard for the sixth commandment. We see that in chapter five. We see that in chapter seven. They have no regard for the seventh commandment either. Now, brethren, this is a pretty wretched place to be as a professor of the true religion. Right? When, when God speaks his truth, when God speaks his law, we're not supposed to take and choose what we want. It's not like, well, you know, like six of the, the Ten Commandments are okay. I, I, I like six of the ten. There's a few that, you know, they just kind of bug me, and I'm not sure I'm all in for that. Uh, we don't have the wherewithal to do that. As the creature of God, the creator, we are obliged to do precisely what he tells us without the, the promise of reward even. Luke 17, 10, when we do all that we've done, we're only unprofitable servants doing what we were commanded to do. The creature owes obedience to the creator. And these creatures have no regard whatsoever for the creator. In fact, they want to take him and they want to throw him up on a cross and they want to murder him because they are outraged at his conduct. The whole thing is a sham. They're not concerned with the law. They're not concerned with Moses. They're not concerned with adultery. They're not concerned with any of it. Now, when Jesus points the law back to them in verse 8, it does affect them, it does convict them, and it does cause them now to leave the scene. And that brings us then to the forgiveness of the woman. This is wonderful, right? She's been standing there listening to this. She didn't have John tell her, oh, by the way, they're testing him now. John tells us that. It's kind of like Genesis 22, verse 1. The Lord tests Abraham, tells Abraham to take his son, his only son, the son whom he loves, up to Mount Moriah and there sacrifice him to Yahweh. Well, we the reader get Genesis 22, 1 we get that God is testing Abraham. Abraham didn't get that memo that morning. As far as Abraham knew, this was the last day that Isaac was going to be with him. Actually, we know that he had the belief that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead if indeed he carried out that sacrifice. So the lady here, standing, listening to this dialogue, does not know that these men are testing Jesus. As far as she's concerned, she was just caught in a capital offense, She's standing there waiting to hear what the adjudication is. She's standing waiting to hear what the disposition will be. Either she dies for her crime or she uh, uh, lives to fight another day. And so notice what Jesus says to her. He says in verse 9, or after verse 9, Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of you? Has no one condemned you? This is the response of the Savior to the woman. So he upholds the law of Moses, but he's also the friend of sinners. See, that's the way you navigate the horns of a dilemma. You uphold both of them. I mean, there's other tactics that are, that are employed in the dealing, of, uh, dealing with a dilemma, but this is what Jesus does. So, woman, where are those accusers of, you, of yours? Has no one condemned you? Notice the response of the woman. They're testing him. They despise him. They abhor him. They want to kill him. They want to rid the world of him. But for her, she calls him Lord. Not maybe in its sense of sir, that would certainly be appropriate in a context like this, but oftentimes we see persons in the gospel narratives speaking better than they knew. And so these men despise the Lord of glory. These men want to execute the Lord of glory. These men want to rid the world of the Lord of glory. And yet when she responds, she said, no one, Lord. None of these accusers are, are standing here. 
Now, perhaps at this point, she's starting to have the pitter-patter of her heart, wondering, hey, this may end up pretty good. This may work to my benefit. No witnesses. She would have known the law as well. She knew that she was breaking the law, but she'd actually know what the stipulation was for a violation of that law. But she would know as well what we often forget, that the old covenant code was not without checks and balances. Persons hear that the Bible teaches the death penalty, and they conclude, well, then everybody will be executed because everybody's messed up. No, you could not execute a person without two or three witnesses. If there was only one witness to the crime, you did not have the, the corroboration to carry out capital punishment. So this woman would know that. Now that her accusers are no longer present, she's probably thinking, I'm going to get off. I'm going to be free. I'm not going to get executed. She does face the Lord Jesus Christ and finds him to be, in fact, a friend of sinners. Because look at what he goes on to say. Verse 11, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. He upholds the law and he's a friend for sinners. He upholds the law and he is the one that stood on that last day, that great day of the feast, and bids everyone who's thirsty to come to him and drink. He upholds the law and he tells her then, go and sin no more. Again, the specific admonition is go and sin this sin no more. Don't continue in adultery. Don't continue in this crime. And notice, brethren, she is guilty. She was, in fact, caught. The Lord Jesus knows she's guilty. The Lord Jesus pronounces forgiveness by saying, neither do I condemn you. He gives the specific admonition, go and sin no more. Don't commit adultery anymore. But a general doctrine as a forgiven sinner, as one who by grace believes on the Lord Jesus, as one justified, now you are to follow those things which are pleasing in the sight of God. See, the Christian religion is unlike every other religion. Every other, well, I don't know if I could say every other, for at least the ones I know. Most religions say, do good and get your reward. Do good and get your reward. Typically, it's more of a more good than bad sort of thing. If I've done more good than bad on that day of judgment, then I hope to sort of weasel my way in. But it's always that pattern. Do and get. Christianity is the opposite. It's get and do. There's an indicative. That means the mood of reality. The fact is, is that when we believe the gospel, by the grace of God, we pass from death to life. As we heard in the reading in 1 Peter, we're called out of darkness into marvelous light. The sovereign God of heaven and earth makes us alive. The sovereign God of heaven and earth gives us faith and repentance. The sovereign God of heaven and earth gives us the ability to believe on the Lord Jesus and thus be forgiven of our sins and receive that righteousness that comes from Christ. And then it's on the heels of that that we go live in a manner that is consistent with the gospel of our salvation. Not in order that we may be saved, but because by grace we have been saved. He upholds that theology. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin this particular sin no more. And as a general rule, go and sin no more. Be faithful. Be holy. Pursue those things that are pleasing in, in the sight of God. Never forgetting 1 John 2, 1 and 2, where John says, my little children, I write these things so, so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. So the goal is go and sin no more. But God knows us. God has spoken to this in Romans 7 and Galatians 5, that there is in our hearts as believers a proneness to wander, a proneness to leave the God that we love. Pursue sinlessness, pursue holiness, pursue righteousness. But when you falter, when you stumble, when you fall, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. It's about him. We're not going to heaven because of us. We're not going to heaven because we're good. We're not going to heaven because we're wise. We're not going to heaven because we've stumbled onto some truth. We're going to heaven because Christ came from heaven, lived in perfect obedience to the law of his Father, died as a sacrifice at the cross, and was raised again the third day. 
the apostle summarizes that beautiful transaction in Romans 4. He says that Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses. Why did Christ go to that cross? He was holy, harmless, and undefiled. He went because we're unholy, we're full of harm, and we're thoroughly defiled. He went to that cross for us. He did everything that pleased the Father. He says that in John's gospel. My meat is the, the, to do the will of him who sent me. I always do that which my Father commands. None of us can say that. We can't say that for a millisecond. We can't wake up on a Sunday morning, you know, get the, the, the gunk out of our eyes and, and have any thought whatsoever that we're perfectly obedient to the law of God. If the law of God is summarized in the two main heads, love to God, love to neighbor as yourself, you have to see and appreciate you fail miserably. I fail miserably. That's why nobody enters into heaven based on their failing miserably. They enter into heaven based on Christ's success, Christ's righteousness, Christ's perfection, Christ's blood. Remember Paul in Roman, or Ephesians 1, 7, in him. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, and then he says, according to the riches of his grace. We'll see more of that tonight in Ephesians chapter 2. Brethren, it is the riches of God's grace that advances the kingdom of Christ on earth. It's not the, the riches of man's accomplishment, the riches of man's wisdom, the riches of man's law keeping, the riches of man's merit. It's the riches of grace. And the good news for any and all here, you may not have been caught in adultery this morning and sort of brought out here, you know, for some sort of public tribunal, but you're a sinner. Every single one of us has sinned against a holy God. Every single one, all we like sheep have gone astray. The apostle says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks after God. There's no fear of God before the eyes of men or in the hearts of men. And we should fear this God. Both Jeremiah and John the apostle asked the question, who would not fear thee, O king of the nations? For indeed it is thy due. In other words, he's a great and awesome God. We should fear him. We should revere him. We should honor and praise him. But by nature, because we're dead in Adam, we don't. But by grace, by the riches of his grace, when we respond in light of John 7, 37, when the thirsty, needy, guilty sinner comes to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, he receives everlasting life. He receives that living water. He receives the Holy Spirit. He receives every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Christ deals with this woman according to compassion. Christ deals with the scenario according to the law. Christ upholds both in terms of their particular dilemma, and he shows himself to be the friend of sinners. And again, brethren, she was not the conventional one. She didn't come to church willingly that morning, wanting her sins exposed, wanting conviction for sin, so that she could close with the Savior. She was pulled out of whatever wretched situation she was in. She was used as a pawn. She was brought before the Savior, and now she goes justified by his blood. She goes justified by grace through faith in him. She goes now as one who has received the Holy Spirit, that blessed possession of God's people. It is a wonderful display of the wisdom of our Savior. It's a wonderful display of his commitment to the law of God. And it is a wonderful demonstration of his role as Savior for sinners. In conclusion... We won't deal with objections to the death penalty. He's not objecting to the death penalty. The Bible tells us in Genesis 9 and in Romans 13 that the civil government is armed with the sword to execute God's wrath in history. That's Bible. That's biblical. That's the truth. Now, when men say, well, we're not going to do that, that seems harsh and barbaric. No, when God commands something for civil polity, our responsibility is to obey. And I dare say if our government spent more time wielding the sword against criminal elements instead of messing with every other jot and tittle of our lives, they would be actually doing what God ordained them to do. But in terms of the narrative, notice the wretchedness of the leaders. Again, I submit they're going tit for tat. 
Jesus exposed them in John 17, 19. Nicodemus exposed them in John 7, 51. What's the response from godly men? Thank you for showing me my sin. Now I can repent. What's the response of ungodly men? They lash out. They attack. They say, well, what about you? What about your issue? What about your shortcoming? And that is precisely what they're trying to expose here. They want to show Jesus is a fraud. That the one who says or, 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 or exclaims his fidelity to the law of Moses really isn't. And the one who says that he's a friend for sinners, he'll give you up in a second and watch you bleed to death for your crimes. That's their tactic. As well, the leaders do not have regard for the law at all. Whatever they're doing here, it is hypocritical. Whatever they're doing here, it is a sham. Whatever they're doing here is a fake. John tells us in verse 6, this they said to test him. As well, the leaders are engaged in testing Jesus that they might accuse him. So this is where we're at in the narrative. Now, we all know where it's going. Unless you've never read the gospel accounts, unless you've never been exposed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, let me tell you what's going on. There is this rising opposition against Jesus. I mean, rising welcome, rising reception, rising persons who come to him and want to hear him and in, and in faith lay hold of him. But there's this enmity growing, this animosity growing, this, this wickedness on the part of the religious leadership. Well, it's going to culminate in the end part of this gospel record when the crowds say, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pontius Pilate is going to try to make a deal with the Jews because Pontius Pilate knows that Jesus isn't guilty. He knows that he's not guilty. In fact, he confesses it three times in the trial that Jesus is guiltless. I find no guilt in this man. I find no guilt in this man. I find no guilt in this man. It's kind of like the angels in Isaiah 6 when they threefold say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So Pilate says, well, I've got a custom and we've got a custom during the Passover. I can release a prisoner to you. I can release one to you. That'll hopefully satisfy your bloodlust and we'll get this done. Because he knew that the, the leadership had handed up Jesus because of envy. So there's two men, Jesus, and then there's a man by the name of Barabbas. Barabbas was a nasty man. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. Barabbas was, dare I say it, a domestic terrorist. He was a bad egg. He was a bad guy. He was destined to be crucified on that day by the civil state for being an insurrectionist. So what do you think the crowd does? Well, we don't want, you know, Barabbas. The guy's wicked. He blows up buildings. He walks in, you know, plants his charge, does his thing. He's a, he's a beast of a man. No, they, you know the narrative. Give us Barabbas? Well, what do you want me to do with this, the, the, this king of Israel? Away with him, away with him, crucify him. So this opposition to him, this enmity to him is rising. It's growing. Now, see, they probably would have to concede that what Nicodemus said is right. Doesn't our law stipulate that a man must actually be guilty before we get rid of him? They knew, of course, that it did. So what are they trying to do now? They're trying to hide under the cover of law to get rid of Jesus. But again, they don't care one bit about the law. Notice their lack of love for humanity. We see this in our own political climate, wherein persons are used as pawns for politics. You see it with the immigration situation. You see it as well with shootings, mass shootings. Those people become pawns to take away guns from persons that don't engage in mass shooting. It's a wretched way to do politics. It is a wretched and beastly mistreatment of human beings. That's how they treat this woman. She was caught in the very act. And of course, according to verse 9, these men too had been in the very act. These men too were, you know, superior to this woman. They were looking down their noses at this woman. They in their self-righteousness, their smugness, their absolute wickedness completely testify to their utter hatred. Not only for Jesus, but for Moses as well. They don't care about the law. They don't care about Moses. They have gotten rid of the very God of heaven and earth in their conduct. The leaders are guilty of violating 
uh, the, the seventh commandment. They're guilty of violating the sixth commandment, and it will culminate in the death of our Savior. And I want to end on the Savior. The Lord Jesus navigates the horns of a dilemma. Not only does he uphold the law, he shows mercy and compassion, and he silences these fools. Now, obviously, there's discourse on the heels of what he says in verse 12, which we'll pick up, but it's going to get pretty strong in chapter 8. I mean, they're going to go head to head in terms of confrontation. Later, they're going to say, when, when he disregards their notion of a true commitment or a true attachment to the living and true God or to even Abraham. And they're like, yeah, we weren't born of fornication. Hint, hint, wink, wink, like, like you were, Jesus. They had an idea of what had happened in terms of the, the virgin birth. But of course, they put the worst possible spin on it. So the Lord Jesus is going to go head to head with these particular men. At this point, he silences them. And the Lord Jesus as well demonstrates the truthfulness of John 7, 37 and 38. The woman was guilty of the sin of adultery. You ever heard somebody preach the gospel or tell you about the gospel? And they say, you know, God's a holy God. And man is a sinful man. And Christ is the only way for salvation. We don't usually get into, well, what kind of sins? Is it just the respectable sins? He forgives gossip. He forgives, you know, a bit of self-righteousness. He, he forgives, you know, covetousness. He forgives sin. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous. What's the psalmist saying? Psalm 133 and 4, he says, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I'm going to have to check out. Check out. If, if God has his ink, pa, uh, ink pen and his pad of paper, and he's watching, and he's checking boxes every moment of every day that I'm sinning, if you, O Lord, should do that, then who could stand? If that psalm ended there, that would be very depressing, wouldn't it? We'd probably say, oh man, that's terrible. I just want to go crawl under a rock now. But the psalmist doesn't end there. He says, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. In 1 John 1, 9, we hear, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we ask the question, Maybe we're thinking about in our own heads, well, you know, I don't know about my sin. <laughs> Maybe some of these other people's sins, they, they seem to be a respectable lot. They seem to have gotten their, you know, their act together in some way, shape, or form. Nobody in here ever got their act together in any way, shape, or form. God, in his grace, picked us up out of the miry clay, washed us in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus, and cleansed us, or clothed us, rather, with his righteousness. None of us had a come-to-Jesus moment that originated with us. It's God's grace. It does not depend upon him who wills or upon him who runs, but on God who shows mercy. And Jesus evidences that on the heels of the declaration, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He shows that that fountain of living water avails even for a woman caught in adultery in the very act, a capital offense. Moses said she should be stoned to death. What say you? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Paul was right on when he said, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Again, if he stopped there, wow, let's find a rock to go crawl under. But he says to the Corinthians, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So if you are a believer here this morning, rejoice in the Savior who has delivered you from your sin. If you are not a believer here this morning, come. You're thirsty. You may not recognize it, but you've got a thirst that only one can satisfy, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes it very clear, very obvious, and very evident what is in view. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me. It's by grace, through faith, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, may God bless 
And may God call out of darkness into marvelous light, and may we rejoice in his goodness and kindness to us. Well, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity in John 8, verses 1 to 11. We thank you for the Savior and his wisdom and the way that he dealt with these, these religious leaders wanting to kill him. As well, we thank you that he is, in fact, a friend for sinners and one who does give that living water to all who come to him in faith. May you bless the word as it goes forth today. May you indeed cause it to go forth conquering and to conquer. And we pray that you would be glorified and that sinners would be done good by salvation through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray in his most blessed name. Amen. We can take your hymn books and turn to 568. 568 will stand as we sing together. Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. Father, thank you for the Savior, for sinners. Thank you for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege that is ours, gathering together to come to the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we confess that God Most High is all in all. May you bless us, may you keep us, may you watch over us, and may you help us to glorify you this day and every day. And we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, please be seated for a brief time of meditation. <clears throat> 